Welcome to Unit 4, Lesson 1. We're now in our fourth unit in the single semester course. Uh, so as usual, we're looking for the tasks to complete for today. It's uh, tasks for U4L1. You should see it under assignments or on the uh, Disease and Public Health Canvas homepage on the weekly calendar. Today's date is December 1st. As usual, we're gonna start off with a little group chat share. The question today I just posted, if you could pick up a new skill in an instant, what would it be? You guys haven't answered this yet, have you? No? Okay. So skill I define very broadly. It could be, you could be really specific about one single thing you want to learn how to whittle or something, or very general, like I want to learn language or be able to learn languages or, you know, cook or whatever. Um, so think about it. I'm inspired by, I don't know if anyone's seen The Matrix, it's an older movie now, but computerized brains where you could just download knowledge into your brain. So like what's something you would want to learn instantly or pick up instantly? And uh, don't forget to say hi and check in with the person you're in the room with too. We'll come back together in two minutes. Rooms are open. Sharon, everybody. Uh, there wasn't any homework to review or even classwork because uh, we had the assessment. So uh, now it's just welcoming you to uh, our new unit. Uh, before we start with that though, I did want to kind of do a quick survey and reflection about um, COVID-19 and what's going on with COVID-19 in the news. Uh, we just got through a holiday weekend, and so what's been all over the news recently is worries about a potential surge following this. Uh, so I'm just going to share a very short two-minute video with you, and then have you fill out a little anonymous survey about your activities over the break and uh, some of your thoughts about this. So this is just a short little BBC video about Christmas. So this is referring to the UK. Uh, let me optimize my screen here. All right, here we go. This Christmas across the UK, people are allowed to meet up with other people they don't live with and celebrate indoors. The British government says up to three households, including your own, can mix indoors. Think of it like a giant support bubble, or support bauble if you prefer. Scotland has gone further though, saying this Christmas bubble should only have eight people in at the most, but says children under 12 don't count. Now this bubble can exist for five days, between the 23rd and 27th of December. If you're in Northern Ireland though, you get an extra day either side of this for travel time. Now you can still meet people from outside your bubble outdoors, depending on which tier your area is in just before the festive season. But when it comes to socialising in a home with your Christmas bubble, you shouldn't mix with lots of different people every day. You need to pick your favourites and only see them during this period. You can also meet your bubble at a place of worship or in an outdoor public place. Now the rules say you can do this, but is it a good idea? Do you want to expose elderly relatives and those who might be vulnerable to this virus either in your home or being a guest in someone else's home? The virus doesn't care that it's Christmas. It'll keep spreading regardless. It's happened in Canada with Canadian Thanksgiving. We're gonna see the same in the States with American Thanksgiving. How much risk are you willing to take at this point in time with your family and your loved ones? But if you are going to have people around, what can you do to reduce the chances of the virus spreading in your home? If someone has symptoms, don't let them in. Open the windows and doors so fresh air can circulate around your home and keep your distance from people. Wearing masks indoors will help stop the chances of the virus spreading, but meeting people outside is much safer. Now remember, the less time you spend with other people, the better. Shorter visits are safer than longer ones. But the best thing to do to be sure you're not infecting anyone else is to self-isolate for 14 full days and then go directly to the people you want to spend the festive season with. But that's a luxury a lot of people just can't afford to do. All right, so now there's a short survey um, on Google Forms. This is on task complete step number two. Just click on that link right there, COVID-19 Thanksgiving survey. Uh, take a few minutes to fill that out. I'm gonna time for like, let's say 15 minutes, um, but I'm hoping that we'll mostly get done well before 15 minutes. I'll keep an eye on that. And once we've got 13 submissions, which is everybody, uh, we'll come back together, go for it. similar messaging to what you've been seeing in the news and stuff you know, they were making a lot of announcements kind of like that right before Thanksgiving the UK though has been very strict about this stuff so um, do you think this is uh, control holiday gathering practices justified it looks like most of you said yes um, and should be enforced so I'm curious to see what will happen after Thanksgiving and, and if we'll have stricter um, you know restrictions uh, for Christmas travel things like that um, 
So what do you notice? Yeah, that they are they are in fact going down. If you look at that graph from um, our world and data, um, the UK had a surge. They enforced uh, more lockdown proceedings, and they've gone back to what they're calling a tiered system. Uh, you can look it up. It's kind of interesting, but again, it's just it's kind of like the color coding um, that the California is using as well. Um, so looking at travel, what did you do for Thanksgiving? Most people were with immediate family. Some of you had guests, and looks like about between five and ten people. So that's good. Um, that's reasonable size. Um, no one exceeded 10 to 15 people. Uh, no one traveled for Thanksgiving. It's encouraging to see. I know that's kind of a, seems like a downer, but it's good for safety. Um, so it looks like some people in terms of social quarantine, some people did, some people didn't, yeah, um, or didn't have guests. Interesting, even distribution here about practices. Five of you had none as well. Even just mask wearing inside, it felt a little weird at first, but um, you know, we tried to, uh, for my, we had immediate family, we kept our masks on as much as possible, but let's take a look. What are some things people can do? Only gather with immediate family, wearing masks, very similar messaging to what you saw in the video, avoiding eating together, socially distancing. Yeah, like sh online shopping, I'm, I think it's gonna be a huge hit uh, this year, even like Black Friday, you could see most sales were online or have been done beforehand. Zoom calling in with relatives. All right, yeah, it looks like a lot of you have good ideas and again are aligned with that messaging from the video. Looks like most people are again for Christmas are gonna keep it to immediate family or um, having no plans. So, all right, I'm glad to see that a lot of you have uh, safety in mind. Any other comments or anything on, on the video or how the holiday season is gonna be a little different? I think for me, the trick is just still keeping it special, you know, finding a way to be festive, um, but being socially distant, I think that kind of still makes it fun. It's just kind of a new normal. So mindset you kind of have to, to grasp. So, all right, uh, we are starting a new unit now. Um, I'm calling this um, diseases in history. Um, so we're gonna be looking at a history of uh, past pandemics and other diseases. Um, specifically, what I'm hoping to cover between now and when we leave for winter break uh, is bioterrorism, mad cow disease, uh, the, boo, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, smallpox in the Americas, Spanish flu, and if we have time, we'll, we'll look at malaria and sickle cell anemia in Africa, which uh, isn't on any like record-holding scales, but I think is really interesting uh, and is a pretty uh, impactful disease still. Uh, so I wanted to start off today with uh, discussing bioterrorism. This was something I wanted to squeeze into our previous unit, but um, ran out of time. It's going to use some slides and some poll questions again to quickly review what you'll be reading about tonight in Gladwin, all about bioterrorism. Um, I'm going to look at my iPad here real quick. All right, just need verbal confirmation. Everyone's seeing um, agents of bioterrorism in front of them? Yep. All right, and again, please no. let me know if like it freezes or if the slides disappear. I had a previous class where the slides just froze halfway through and I kept on teaching because it looked fine on my iPad and no one said anything until I got through it all. So uh, please interrupt me if things uh, don't seem to be working. Um, so bioterrorism is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it is the use of diseases uh, and other pathogen agents as weapons against other people. Um, the other kind of the origin of this though and what you're gonna hear more often is biological warfare. Um, and it's got a long and really dark history, um, very disturbing. There's lots and lots of examples and instances. I'm gonna focus on just a few key highlights. Uh, first one is way back in 1346, and if you know anything about the plague, uh, that's a significant date. Uh, but apparently there was a siege on a city in Crimea, I think it's called Kaffa, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but these, um, uh, I don't know if it's Tatar or Tater forces, um, had besieged this uh, city. And one thing that they did was they catapulted corpses into the city over the wall uh, who had died of the plague. And again, they had no idea what was causing the plague. They, you know, they called it the pestilence, uh, but the plague is actually caused by a bacterium. It's a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. Uh, and so by catapulting these dead bodies into the city, uh, it did begin to spread amongst the population. Um, again, through probably flea bites and things like that, uh, and uh, caused a lot of death. But the significance of this event was that either people fleeing from this siege 
or they believe soldiers just coming back from fighting in this war were the ones who brought the plague to Europe and this was the start of what's called the Black Death, um, this, the worst disease outbreak in history, um, started in 1347, uh, the following year, and they think this event was what brought the plague into Europe. Uh, the plague had already been around for a long time and it hit different other parts of the world, but this was its first big arrival in Europe and it killed a lot of people. Uh, another event that some people might be familiar with was actually here in the Americas in 1763. Um, Fort Pitt, which is where uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is right now, um, was occupied by um, Native American tribe, the Lenape, or they're sometimes called the Delaware too. Uh, the British Army had it under siege. This was during Pontiac's War, which is a, sort of an offshoot of the um, French and Indian War. Uh, but this, uh, you can look up this guy up, this British uh, general, um, he's a lord, I think as well, Jeffrey Amherst, uh, approved, and they have documentation and letters showing this, uh, the delivery of blankets, uh, two blankets and a scarf that were laden with smallpox um, that people uh, who had died of smallpox had been wearing or been exposed to, and they handed this over during a parley, which is meant to be sort of like a more peace, like having a peace talk, trying to work things out. Um, and it is possibly resulted in an outbreak of smallpox. The reason they say possibly is because, again, we have no historical evidence to show that it actually caused the outbreak, and smallpox was already um, spreading amongst both the British and Native American populations at that time, and so um, it's hard to quantify what impact this might have had, but still is evidence of use of biological warfare and deception, which is pretty uh, horrifying. Uh, there are also, again, there's numerous historical examples you can look at. There's lots of fictional depictions as well. If you're familiar with any of these, uh, V for Vendetta, it's a comic and also a movie, is basically like a government um, using a disease to control population. Uh, if you've read Stephen King's The Stand, it's an awesome book. They've made a couple TV programs out of it too, but this is a, it's a military design virus that gets out of a facility and they call it Captain Trips. It's basically the flu kills lots of people. That's really only the beginning of it. Um, the rest of the book is kind of more just about the aftermath. Uh, 12 Monkeys, uh, there's a more recent remake of this as a TV show, um, this is the movie. Um, but again, same thing, it's, uh, it's kind of like a bioterrorist attack, like these environmentalists release a, a disease to kill off humans so that Earth can go back to other animals. Um, and this one's more about time travel and stuff, trying to, trying to stop them. But anyway, these are all really cool. And uh, I love hearing about other examples if anyone has uh, any other suggestions. Um, but they're all kind of based on acts of bioterrorism or biological warfare. So uh, the next big important date was 1975. The United Nations had what was called the Biological Weapons Convention, uh, where they basically got pretty much every member country um, to sign a treaty to prohibit the production and stockpiling of biological weapons. Um, so this was really big. Virtually every country signed it or ratified it or did something with it. Um, I also think that the kind of dawn of nuclear weapons and nuclear energy also kind of distracted a little bit from the development of biological weapons. Um, but either way, this was kind of a nice big step forward in terms of avoiding the use of those, uh, these kinds of weapons. All right, first poll question for you. Should be on the screen right now. I'll give that a go. Oops, my bad. This is uh, <laughs> everyone a little confused. Uh, that is the wrong poll question. My bad, guys. Sorry, that's for my Science 2 class. Here we go. This is the relevant poll question. All right, seeing 12 out of 13 responses. I'll give it 10 more seconds. Hey, there we go. All right. Looks like yeah, some people don't have a lot of faith in, uh, in this treaty, I guess, uh, that either probably or definitely. Um, yeah, so who knows that, you know, there's always rumors of Area 51 secret laboratories, something like that in different countries uh, developing weapons. Um, I think what some countries are probably doing illegally or behind the back is the development of chemical weapons. That's been another big thing. Uh, I don't know how much uh, there is going on with biological stuff just because there's a lot of infrastructure uh, that needs to be done around that. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I have my doubts as well. Sorry about the uh, thermo, uh, <laughs> thermochemistry question. Uh, love that some people just kept answering it anyway. 
Um, all right, so um, your Gladwin book outlines uh, bioterrorism. You'll be reading about it tonight, but basically uh, I want to focus on what they call category A um, agents, which are basically what are the most dangerous things? What is if you know, terrorists or were able to get their hands on these different pathogen types, uh, these are the ones that would be the most effective or most likely to be used. Uh, we've already learned about anthrax, uh, it's a bacterium. Um, what makes anthrax or Bacillus anthracis effective is that it's uh, the, an endospore, right? The, um, the, it can survive as just a dry powder for long periods of time. You can stick it in containers, whatever. Um, and so and it, it can infect a lot of people uh, through a lot of different ways, right? You can, it can be inhaled and infect the lungs. It can get into cuts in the skin. It can enter the digestive system. Uh, it can get right into the bloodstream. And it has really bad effects no matter what entry point it takes. Um, and again, it could be put in like a crop dusting plane and, and flown over a city. And if it was sprayed, uh, your book has speculation about that, that it would kill a whole lot of people um, still, or again, could be put on fabrics or hides. Um, so all kinds of bad stuff that anthrax could pose. However, being a bacterium, we do have antibiotics that are now quite effective against uh, anthrax infection, as long as you're getting them pretty quickly uh, right after your exposure and you continue to take them for a long period of time, you can avoid the adverse effects of that. Smallpox is another one. Um, the reason that they are worried about smallpox uh, being used as a weapon is because we no longer vaccinate against it. So vaccinations actually start, stopped in the US in 1972. Uh, in 1980, the uh, World Health Organization declared smallpox eradicated, which is an awesome accomplishment. Unfortunately, there are still samples in some places, right? Uh, the US and Russia in particular famously have samples frozen on ice. Uh, but they're also finding, if you remember from the Bryson reading, they're finding like random samples in old basements and old universities too that just weren't accounted for. Um, so that's a little scary. Uh, the reason again is it's highly contagious. It has a death rate of 30%. So compared to COVID right now is at about 2%. Um, and it causes these uh, really horrible pustules on the surface of the skin. The book will talk about them as like dew drops on a rose. Uh, and you saw pictures of this earlier, um, but it permanently scars you even if you do recover from it. Um, and again, you can see them right here. Um, not pleasant. Uh, can get into the eyeballs too and blind and things like that. So not, not a good situation. Um, but again, we also have a very effective vaccine against smallpox. And so if there ever was an attack or something like that, um, getting the vaccination back out to the public um, could probably happen quickly and would be effective at preventing that. And I think there are some antiviral treatments now too that are effective. If you remember, smallpox was the first disease to ever be vaccinated against. We learned about Edward Jenner and his observations about milkmaids not having smallpox because they were exposed to cowpox, a lighter version of it, and that's what he started to inject into children and, and then, you know, went on the voyage to on basically the first big vaccination mission. Uh, and then there's plague, uh, bubonic, uh, well, there's different forms of it. Um, plague, again, as I mentioned, is another bacterium, Yersinia pestis. Uh, it infects only two types of mammals, uh, rodents and humans. And so if you ever get those two together, you're going to see the disease being transferred, usually by biting insects, the fleas in particular. Um, so the rodents carry it, but the fleas are the ones that actually transmit it. Uh, you get bubonic, um, which is a reference, reference to um, these things that form. They, they call them, I forget the name, but they, it's another boo, something like that. Uh, but it's your lymph nodes uh, swell up drastically. Um, and there's also pneumonic, which is... Um, if it gets into the lungs, it causes what's called dry gangrene necrosis, uh, where basically the tissue in your extremities, your fingers, your toes, your nose, uh, will die and turn black. Um, this is what happens with frostbite as well. Uh, but that's where the name the Black Death comes from, because that was a pretty telltale sign, uh, uh, especially in the corpses, um, that they had died from uh, this bacterial infection. Uh, in terms of what's actually happening here, I need to look it up. I'm not entirely sure. It's some kind of blockage of circulation, clearly. Um, that's causing that. Uh, and again, you'll often see pictures of rats uh, associated with, um, you know, plague art and books and things like that. But in my opinion, they're kind of unduly blamed um, because yes, they do get the disease. Um, so here's the um, bacterium that uh, causes it. And uh, the issue arises because it'll be in wild my rats and that's not a problem. But when you have rats that move into um, cities and domestic areas, they're attracted by food, waste, unsanitary conditions, right? They're hungry, they come, they're living closer and closer to humans. That's when, if they're close enough, the fleas that are on the rats can then transfer to humans, bite them, and transfer this bacteria. Uh, and that's what, again, was happening in Europe. And uh, just 
was had a devastating effect, killed huge amounts of the population. Um, okay, next poll question. I think I skipped a poll question in the middle there somehow. Um, so here's one to consider. Give that a try. Okay, seeing 12 out of 13 responses. All right, very good. Most of you are understanding that yes, we do have medications uh, for anthrax. Antibiotics are very effective against that. Smallpox, we have a very effective vaccine. And as far as I know from that vaccine now, there are some antiviral treatments that are effective uh, as well. Um, all right, one last question relating to the very end there. Let's see here. Okay, give that one a go. Seeing 12 out of 13 responses, but it looks like we're all feeling pretty good. Yes, it is caused uh, the Black Death because of that necrosis that it caused on the extremities, the um, black kind of rotting flesh. All right, any other questions or comments on those slides? Scary stuff. Hopefully uh, nothing will happen like you see in the fictional um, depictions. Uh, and if you have any recommendations about that, again, I love sci-fi movies and books that are kind of all based on that. Okay, so now I'm going to have you work in pairs through a little quiz I made based on an infographic about uh, the history of pandemics. Um, so just to show you really quickly, uh, this talk, I have a link to um, this website. Uh, it's two infographics that are about the history of pandemics. Here's the first one. And if you scroll down, the second one's right below it, or I guess it's kind of technically all part of one right there. Uh, and then you'll also be looking at this table down here a little bit um, to answer some questions in the quiz. So I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms with partners. Uh, and again, the link to it is right there on the bottom, step number five. Um, in your partners, the two people who are in the breakout room, uh, one of you should be the reader. Um, and that means you're just reading instructions, reading questions out loud so your other partner can follow along. Timer, you're gonna keep track of time. I'll, I'll blast out a little announcement once everyone's in their breakout rooms. Uh, but you're also making sure, again, that you've both answered the question in your own quiz. So you're each answering the questions in your own quiz before you move on. So I shouldn't see one person finishing up everything before the other person, right? Try to work on this together as you go through it. Um, okay, I think I've recreated the breakout rooms. Uh, so, um, all right, I'll make a time announcement, but otherwise just work together to complete the quiz. Go for it, rooms are open. So, what'd you think? I kind of like that infographic. I had a whole other one set up from uh, National Geographic that I want to show you. They designed it more like a graph, and it was cool because they also showed like duration and uh, number of deaths. But the way they labeled it was super confusing in that they, they overlaid things. And so, you know, I didn't, I like this one. I thought this infographic was a little bit clearer. Um, and the numbers checked out from what I could, could see as well. So, um, let's see how we did. Um, let me refresh this one more time. So in terms of how they define a pandemic, um, a pandemic is, uh, it could be countrywide or 
worldwide. Um, we usually associate it with more like a worldwide spread, like it is now gone continent to continent, um, but could technically be countrywide as well, fits that definition. Um, the deadliest pandemic in history, I kind of mentioned it in the slides, but it was indeed the bubonic plague or referred to as the Black Death. Again, there had been outbreaks of the plague in the past, but this one, once it hit Europe, um, it was just a perfect combination of totally unsanitary living conditions um, and uh, a total lack of understanding of what caused the disease, right? They thought it was a pestilence and a, and a you know, a curse. Uh, didn't really get the, the idea of sanitation uh, and ways to protect yourselves from it. Um, Deadliest pandemic within the last 50 years has been the HIV AIDS uh, and is technically an ongoing pandemic, um, even though we do have very effective treatments, very effective vaccines for it. Um, it's something that we're still kind of um, combating. Uh, World Health Organization declared uh, COVID-19 pandemic on March 11th. Stevenson transitioned into uh, um, learning around March 16th. Uh, so we moved everybody out. March 16th was kind of the intro day. And then I think the 18th was when we officially had our first day. I don't know if anyone remembers WebEx. We all started with WebEx. Um, but uh, pretty quickly, uh, things we, we moved everyone out once it was declared a pandemic. Um, 30 to 50% of the population of Europe, which is nuts, I mean, that's half of the people, um, was indeed the Black Death. Uh, and it took 200 years for the population of Europe to recover. Um, pretty astounding when you think about it. Uh, smallpox definitely, and this to me is where the area of interest history that I'm fascinated by because there's just not much documentation. They don't know exactly how many uh, Native Americans possibly died from this, but they know that these whole civilizations, you know, Aztecs, Mayans, uh, North America as well, totally ravaged by this disease, had, had no resistance to it. And, and I want to talk a little bit about why, you know, they got hit so hard and, and the Europeans who are arriving didn't like get sick with something else. Um, there's some interesting kind of theories behind that. Um, but uh, yes, it was smallpox that kind of um, decimated those populations and made the colonization of the Americas then uh, happen a lot faster. Roman Empire was hit by the plague of Justinian. Uh, again, this was the, the um, variola virus, the, the black, um, um, yeah, wait, what am I, I'm mixing this up with something else then. But yeah, that was, uh, the plague was uh, spreading throughout there. Um, COVID-19, HIV, AIDS, and MERS are uh, technically all ongoing. They, up until present, uh, MERS is um, respiratory disease. I'm forgetting what the M and the E stand for. But again, is one of these diseases that is becoming multi-drug multi resistant as well, which is a little scary. Um, yeah, all of these uh, famous people um, died from HIV, AIDS. Smallpox and measles is what was causing the Antonine Plague, but again, it's kind of fascinating that um, this is some, one of the kind of first official ones that's documented by historians, but they really can't quite tell what disease it was, right? There's no disease samples left from that time. There's just descriptions of what, how people were dying, and so um, they think it was one of these diseases that was just spreading really, really fast. Um, and, oh, interesting. I don't know why the answers didn't show up. Maybe this is just, hopefully this is just on my side, um, but in terms of, um, what animal? Oh, it's because it was pictures. Um, does anyone know the name of that animal that was pictured there? They're covered in little mm -hmm. scales. Isn't like the pangolin. Yep, pangolins, mm -hmm. uh, which have uh, quite famously been hunted to extinction by humans. And so uh, I have read early reports that people were calling this the pangolin's revenge. Um, they think it's pangolins just because pangolins are very susceptible to coronavirus and they are sold in these uh, animal, like exotic animal food markets, um, which is where they think COVID-19 first uh, made the jump into humans and spread. Uh, but I have read a lot of studies since then that have largely refuted this, um, that there seems to be more evidence of bat DNA uh, and things like that, kind of more standard fare um, for wh where this particular strain of uh, SARS-CoV-2 came from. But All right, any other questions or comments on infographic stuff? We won't be able to cover all these diseases in huge detail, but as I outlined, I'll, I'll um, try to hit a few of those. Uh, homework tonight is to read Gladwin about bioterrorism. Uh, usual deal, submit one a photo of one page of your notes, and there's a little reading quiz you have up to 10 attempts on. That's it for me, kids. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, thank you.